All right, we are back here talking New York Jets football on the podcast. Joining me today, the host of the Manchild Show with Boy Green on 1260 The Score and the host of the Jet Zone podcast, Paul Esden Jr. is here. Paul, how are you? Well, I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me, Mike. Not a problem. Glad to have you on here. And obviously, the Jets have been very active this offseason, made a lot of moves, brought a bunch of new guys in here. What do you think about what they've done thus far? You know, uh, they've uh, checked off a lot of boxes. There's still more to be done, and with uh, obviously less than two weeks uh, before the 2022 NFL draft, they'll have the opportunity to do it, do so. Nine picks overall uh, in the draft, four of those within the top 38, and specifically two of those inside the top 10. But so far, I think they've done a good job. Tight end, I like C.J. Osama and Tyler Conklin. I think those moves went really under the radar, but those are, you know, major upgrades to what the Jets have had at tight end. Uh, uh, in the past, I think Lakin Tomlinson on the interior, I think that gives them a proven guard that's been playing at a very high level for a long time coming off a uh, Pro Bowl season. Go over to the defensive side of the ball. You got Jordan Whitehead, who I think uh, they got at an insane value. He's going to be a nice starter there at safety. You also go to DJ Reed Jr. at corner. I think he's going to be their number one corner for him and really upgrade the overall unit. I really like what they did there. And then there were some, you know, kind of under-the-radar moves, like uh, Solomon Thomas adding him uh, at defensive tackle, providing some nice depth uh, from that perspective. But really, you know, there's some more big swings coming, particularly coming up in the draft. Yeah, absolutely. And if you had to pick one move so far you like the most, what do you think that would be? Oh, I, I'm going C.J. Uzama. Again, he, again, as a guy that try to, you know, has a lot of energy myself and everything that I do, he brings a lot of energy, and I really just think there's an unbelievable untapped potential with what he brings to the table. Again, he's only been playing with a really a really, truly competent quarterback uh, in Joe Burrow over the last couple of years. Prior to that, there's just been a, a, a glut of like Andy Dalton and a lot of other stuff, and obviously, you know, he's had some injuries as well. I just think it's kind of the perfect situation. The, the Jets haven't had anything at tight end, so they haven't thrown to that position. Now Uzama comes in, he's a, a massive target. And uh, I think uh, the upside is unbelievable. Uh, he, for me, especially with, again, how, how I feel about the tight end spot, uh, to me, that's my favorite one. Absolutely. And obviously, one thing that's going to challenge them is all season is just, you know, that they've gotten better. The rest of the AFC has also gotten a lot better. So how do you think the AFC arms race sort of impacts the Jets' chances here to, to improve in 2022? Uh, it, you know, it's been stunning, quite frankly. This is the craziest NFL offseason in history. Uh, all of the movement. I, again, and I feel like even when you start mentioning them, you forget someone else. Like the Bengals are really good. You have Joe Burrow, but you have all the quarterback movement. Welcome in Russell Wilson. Deshaun Watson was in the AFC anyway, but still uh, still he goes uh, to a superstar team. So you start looking at the top of the division, and then the teams that were already there, the Titans were the number one seed last year, but they're like an afterthought when you think about everyone else that's coming in. The Chargers got better. The Bengals got better. The Ravens are still there. So really, it, there's an unbelievable glut. But I don't think, you know, as a Jets people, you can kind of have this loser mentality and say, well, I guess we'll pack it in and try again in a decade. Like, you have no choice. You, they're all, they've are all they all gotten, in you know, marketedly better, obviously, with all the talent they've improved. But it's up to the Jets now. I think, you know, the arms race that you kind of set up the question with, that's why they've been trying to swing for the fences for like a, a Tyree Kill trade. That's why they've had exploratory calls with the Tennessee Titans on A.J. Brown, the San Francisco 49ers, Debo Samuel. Seattle Seahawks, DK Metcalf. We go on and on and on through the list. Like, you know, the rest of the aggression, I think, is infectious energy energy to the Jets, and I think they're going to do everything in their, in their power to try to swing one of those big-time kind of moves ahead of the draft. Yeah, I feel they do need one of those kind of big-time moves. I feel the problem they sort of run into is that they end up having to try and pay the Jet tax, as it's so-called, to get people to come to Florham Park and play on a team that's not been good for a while. I mean, Tyree Hill basically, like, I think they basically begged the Dolphins to get involved and not come here. They were they struck out on Chandler Jones. They couldn't get Amari Cooper. They messed out a bunch of big guys. So what do you think about the line that Joe Douglas walk here not paying the Jets tax and trying to build the old-fashioned way? You know, it is a, a uh, you know a tip of the cap to Joe Douglas for not willing to do that. And again, he had a few opportunities to do it. And the Tyreek Hill deal, for those who don't know, the Jets and Chiefs had a deal in place locked in before anyone else, before the Dolphins or any other team got involved. It was only Jets, and it was only Chiefs. And they, first off, the Jets and Chiefs agreed to trade compensation, and they said, okay, now you can talk to Tyreek. And then they offered him a contract. And again, Drew Rosenhaus, the agent for Tyreek Hill, said, okay, this is good, but I think we could do even better. That's when they got everyone else in. But before he did that, the Jets could have sealed the deal. They could have given Tyreek Hill crazy money, and then the trade would have been done right there 
and Tyreek Hill would be a member of the Jets. But Joe Douglas obviously refused to pay the Jets tax there via trade. He refused to do it, excuse me, in free agency with like a Chandler Jones. who's willing to pay a lot of money for Chandler. He's willing to pay a lot of money for a bunch of the other players. Uh, other guys are interested in B.J. Hill on the defensive line, D.J. Jones on the defensive line. But ultimately, those guys picked to go elsewhere with a fair offer uh, coming on both sides. Again, that's a bold take by Joe Douglas and one that should uh, lead to sustainable success in terms of not just kind of blowing your load, doing a crazy free agency overload, as we've talked about previously, of past GMs just throwing a lot of money at free agency, being maybe good for a short period of time. 2015, they were 10 and 6, and then it all kind of fell apart. So Joe Douglas is going for a long-term approach, but again, at the same time, he doesn't have forever. He needs to win. This is a results-oriented business. At the end of the day, this is about wins and losses. So they need to get more wins, and that aggression is going to have to manifest itself in the draft. Yeah, the draft is very important for him because obviously 2020 looks like a much a bunch of misses in in the draft. 2021 obviously much better. They had some hits, still quite on the quarterback here. So, what do you think here? The game plan is for Joe Douglas with these two first round picks he has, number four and number ten. I think it is. There is a little bit of best player available, but specifically, I think at four, it's edge rusher. And the only thing that changes that is the worst case scenario for Jet fans. Again, there are three teams ahead of them with the Houston Texans, Detroit Lions, and Jacksonville Jaguars, not necessarily in that order. And the worst case scenario is if edges go at all three spots. You have some combination of Trayvon Walker, Aiden Hutchinson, and Kayvon Thibodeau, and you're sitting there at four, and you ask yourself, do I take the fourth edge player off the board like a Jermaine Johnson? Do we you know, set a trend and go in a different direction? That's where maybe you don't go edge in that particular scenario. But if Kayvon Thibodeau is there, and I've said it for a while, He's the pick that I run in, and I know there are concerns with character and a a variety of other things that people have questioned. I think we've gotten a little bit crazy there. That's got to be the ideal thing at four, to pair with Carl Lawson so Robert Sala can try to do something defensively. It was hard to watch last year at points. And then at 10, help out Zach Wilson one way or another, whether you end up going offensive tackle or wide receiver. I think wide receiver is a sexier thing, the thing that makes a lot more sense to me. Either Jameson Williams or Drake London, one of the two picks, Drake London brings you a big body, nasty wide receiver that can give Jet fans, you know, memories of the 2015 Brandon Marshall. It really gave them a lot of different things in the red zone, mismatches, 50-50 ball situations. Or you could go with Jameson Williams, who brings that Tyree Kill-like speed to the table, could bring a vertical passing element to this offense. You can't go wrong with either of those two. But right now it seems like edge rusher at four and then best wide receiver that you like at 10. Yeah, I think the trade back also could be a possibility at 10, too. But I think that you look at some of these teams, now the quarterbacks are not great here, but I think they're sitting at 10, so with the Giants did last year, and just move back a little bit, especially if there's a bunch of receivers all grouped together. They can pick up extra picks and maybe get assets for the future. I could see them considering that as well. 100%. That is an option. Again, if a lot of uh, if there's a glut of players they like, like, let's say a realistic possibility is all the receivers are on the board. Because I think the earliest a receiver could go in this draft is eight to Atlanta. But, you know, no offense to any of your Atlanta Falcons listeners, you know, you know they need everything. So that's the earliest it could go, but they could go in a variety of other directions. Seattle isn't taking it. They're going to add either a corner or a pass rusher or maybe even a quarterback. So that means all the receivers should be on the board at 10. And if they're all at 10 and the Jets like multiple of them, you could drop back a little bit in the draft, maybe to the Eagles at 15 that got multiple, that's got some ammo. Pittsburgh at 20, if you want to go back even further, if they're looking to move up for a quarterback. You know, there's an interesting combination of guys, or even deeper, obviously. Kansas City may be looking to replace Tyreek Hill. Green Bay's got a double dip of first-round selections that could make sense. Of course, the Jets and Ravens have a, have a nice history together. So any one of those combinations could be possible. I think the Jets are very open to trading back. I would expect it more at 10 than 4, but I think uh, they'll keep all options on the table. Yeah, absolutely. And Joe Douglas has shown ability to move around the draft for, I mean, in his first year, 2020, he moved back a couple times, second round land, Denzel Mims may not have worked in terms of the pick, but the philosophy was there. Last year, he traded up with his second first round pick to go get Elijah Vera Tucker. Like, how accurate are they going to be moving around the board? Again, that is uh, that is something he likes to do. Again, it is in his history. Trader Joe is his nickname uh, in the Twitter streets, and for good reason. He is willing, and both players as well, remember, he has been more than willing to send like a late pick to take a chance on a guy. We saw it with Shaq Lawson last year. Uh, there have been others over the last couple of years, uh, both in this regime and others with Henry Anderson, 
you know, Quincy Wilson and other guys that they throw a late pick on to go try to get a starter that may be out there uh, to fill a hole. So I expect that is very much on the table for the Jets. And of course, moving around. And really, if you move in either spot, you can make up for it. For instance, if you trade back from 10, you can then move up from 35 and 38 to get back into the first round. So whatever movement you can make, the Jets have the ultimate flexibility to go up, down, left, right, and diagonal if they choose to be to maximize the board. The thing I want to make sure that Joe Douglas does is make sure that he maximizes that. We all remember a bunch of years ago, the famous Idzik 12. He refused to move. He kept all his picks. And again, if they would have went for quality instead of quantity, maybe they would have had something you know, worth a damn coming out of that draft class instead of what ultimately happened. He has to be incredibly flexible. And fortunately, that is something that's his calling card. Yeah, for sure. I do think with them, I think their dream scenario, correct me if I'm wrong, you think like if one of these big receivers becomes available, whether it's A.J. Brown or Devo Samuel or D.K. Metcalf, that they can swing a trade using either number 10 or the two twos and then find an opportunity to use their picks to trade around and get more ammo. Would that be correct in your opinion? That would be the dream scenario for Joe Douglas. Oh, absolutely. Because again, if you get a wide receiver like any of the ones you named, Scary Terry, DK Metcalf, Debo Samuel, uh, AJ Brown, all of them, all of them are really good and better than what the Jets have, obviously. If you can get one of those guys, first off, wide receiver is solved, obviously, so that's good. And secondly, there's no guessing. You know, all of those players are established players in this league that have some level of resume to them where they're coming in, they can immediately be a number one wide receiver for the Jets. And that's the other part of the trading scenario we just talked about a few minutes ago with this. If you trade whatever it is, whether it's 10 or the two second rounders, either way, we can talk about both scenarios. If you trade 10, the Jets still have fourth overall and then two second round picks. So they would have more than the common team. The average team is one pick per round. If they never make any trades, that's what the NFL gives them so if you're telling me the Jets could trade for any one of those receivers we just mentioned and still have more than the common team then you're doing pretty well for yourself uh if you're the Jets and also if you do that and you want more picks and try to make up and recoup for the loss let's say they move the Tyree Kill package right it was 35 38 69 for whatever random wide receiver you want then trade back from 10 and pick up some of those picks you just lost and boom you get the wide receiver and still get the picks if that's really what Joe Douglas wants to make sure he maintains. It is completely on the table, completely legit, and the Jets are basically keeping their phone on vibrate and they're watching the Twitter stream. See if uh, A.J. Brown, who earlier this week kind of went off on Twitter, removing Tennessee from his Twitter bio and, and going on a mini rant about, hey, if you guys don't want to pay me, that's fine. You know, that's what they're waiting for, and I think, they're waiting for a popcorn in their hand, hoping one of these situations blows up and gives them an opportunity. Yeah, I think the other thing I'm interested in is obviously if they don't end up trading the four receiver, like one does not come available for them. Like I saw a mock on the athletic recently. It's had them trading back into the first round with one of their seconds to go get a guy like Tyler Linder. But I think we just think to see like if they do take the opportunity to take a plunge and go for a third first round pick and they think there's a guy they like slipping towards the end of the round. That would make a lot of sense. Mel Kuyper's mock draft had that as well where uh, they traded back into the back end of the first round, got Tyler Linderbaum. And again, that's why I say you have to maximize your picks. There's a lot of combinations of things you can do. I think four, you, you could go edge rusher. You could go offensive lineman if you like Iki Aquanu. Then 10, you could go wide receiver. The secondary edge rusher, if you didn't get that at four, or like a Jermaine Johnson. And then trade back into the first for one of a variety of things. They could go get their wide receiver of their dreams. Tyler Linderbaum is a guy that could drop. Another player that I know the Jets really like that could drop is Nicobe Dean the linebacker out of Georgia, and it could be similar to the situation we, shot, we saw with Jeremiah wusu uh the guy who had uh, some medical concerns, fell all the way to like 54 for the Cleveland Browns, and they got a great steal. Uh, similar with uh, Nicobe, where he's got the positional value question marks, he has the size question marks, so maybe he slipped, and you can move up for that. Or you can move up for one of the safeties. Jets like Lewisine, there's Daxton Hill out of Michigan. There's a couple of, and really it's kind of a, it wouldn't be the first world problem. It'd be the opposite of that. The, the third world problem is it just have so many needs that you could trade up for a million different things. If players are slipping, you have to be aggressive. I'd be all for Linderbaum, quite frankly, because then you can turn around and either cut Conor McGovern straight up and save nine million bucks, or you can approach him Jamison Crowder style last year, like the Jets did and said, hey, we'll cut you, or you can take a pay cut. And basically, they sliced his contract in half and fully guaranteed it. They could do the same thing for McGovern to ensure some interior offensive line depth, which would never be a bad thing. How much does the tackle position concern you long term? Because obviously, George Fan had a bad first year, great second year, free agent after this season. Mackay Beckton did barely play last season, was bad in camp. So 
Would there be a world where they take a tackle like high and you say, oh, I'm okay with this? A hundred percent. And I know that this is a polarizing take apparently on social media, but look at the future of the offensive tackle position just for a moment. George Fan is a pending free agent, so that's a question mark. He'll be a free agent in 2023. Uh, Makai Becton, obviously, we haven't basically seen him in two years. He played only a handful of snaps in the season opener before he was lost for the year. And even in his first year, he had a lot of injuries. And after that is Connor McDermott and Chuba Idoga. That doesn't, you know, no offense to those guys, but, you know, that doesn't give me any confidence whatsoever to protect Zach Wilson. To be honest, I'm willing to do a Joe Namath guarantee on the show that they take an offensive tackle with one of their pick, their four picks in the top 38. Again, trades and anything could change that, but if they stay where they're at, I fully expect them in one form or another to take an offensive tackle. And quite frankly, they should look at it. No matter what combination you do, you don't have a long-term answer. George Fan is 30 years old, and while he had a nice pop last year and looked great, and thank goodness the Jets had him when Becton went down, there's still a lot of questions there. Are you going to be willing to pay him 18 plus million per year in a long-term deal for a guy on the wrong side of 30? Again, maybe they will be. They like him a lot in the building, but I'm not so sure. So to me, 100% I would draft an offensive tackle either in the first or second round guaranteed. Yeah, let's say for argument's sake here that they don't end up making a trade. They have these four, the four, four uh, picks, two in the first, two in the second year. Like, what positions are they taking with those four picks? All right, so just position. So let's see, four edge, you, you go edge. Uh, let's see, 10, you go wide receiver. Again, no trades being considered, and I don't think he could be complacent or lazy. Again, if there's no trades involved, you have to address wide receiver 10 because you can't just hope that there's an Elijah Moore there at 35 or 38 again this year. That would be uh, that would be uh, you know mismanagement of assets if they chose to do that. So again, edge four, wide receiver 10. And then in the second round, I, I wouldn't mind uh, like a safety at 35. You need another guy to pair there. Uh, with Jordan Whitehead, that would certainly uh, be on the table for me. And then, as I said, you know, my own guarantee that you go offensive tackle there with 38. So some inclusion of that. You can mix them around a little bit, but that's basically the top four I go for. All right. My last question is this. Obviously, they've done a lot of work. They have not won many games in recent years. They won two in 2020, and they won four last year. What's a realistic expectation level for the Jets in 2022? Is it that, you know, they're in the hunt in the late in the season. They're trying to make a playoff push, don't necessarily get there. Like, what's the realistic expectation level here? You know, uh, when you asked me this question, again, we're like uh, nine days away from the draft to what you asked me like a week after the draft. It could be a, a stark difference. That's how big this draft plays a factor in expectations uh, for the New York Jets moving forward. Right now, they're probably, I don't know, a seven-win team, somewhere in that ballpark, a feisty seven-win team. Uh, six, seven win team. But again, if you do enough in the draft, you have the capabilities. Again, four picks in the top 38, nine picks overall, two picks in the top 10. This is a very unique, once in a lifetime opportunity to hit the accelerate button and jump to another level. And obviously, all of that goes to Zach Wilson. Where he goes is where the Jets go. If he sucks, the Jets are going to suck. If he's great and takes a quantum leap with the improved offensive talent around him, then they're just going to be as good as he can be, which could be realistically like a six or seven seed in the AFC playoff picture. That's possible if Zach Wilson makes the leaps that everyone thinks he's capable of. But it all depends on this draft. Again, if you walk away with a good draft, you tell me they walk away with like KT, Jamison Williams, you give me a nice safety like Jaquan Brisker in the second round, and then throw it up like maybe Tyler Smith at a Tulsa. You think that, I'm like, okay, I could see him being, uh, you know, eight, nine, nine, and eight. I could see that. And in the conversation, and uh, to Judge Douglas's point, that's a quote they keep spitting out is uh, playing meaningful game in December where we're not like in October. We're like, oh, the season's over one and seven. Let's look towards the 2023 draft, like being competitive, being, you know, five and four, five and five, six and four, whatever it is. And being on that in the hunt graphic on the screen and having an opportunity to compete for a playoff spot and be in the playoffs for the first time in over 11 years. Absolutely, Paul. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, I could be follow on social media and keep up with some of your other uh, uh, material. Absolutely. Uh, it's uh, You can follow me at BoyGreen25 everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. That's the easiest place to hit me. And uh, a lot of all my shows and content and, and big-time interviews, you can see on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash BoyGreen25. Boy, green the color, 25. Hit it up and hit subscribe. Absolutely. I saw you an interview with uh, Dane Brugler recently. What, any, do you have any fun insights about the uh, Jets draft situation there? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there have been a lot of really great guests that, again, I, I'm just honored that they decided to take a few minutes of their time to come on the show. Mike Tannenbaum, former Jets GM, of course, uh, joined the show. 
uh, Dane Brugler, Bruce Feldman uh, of The Athletic, and Dane of The Athletic as well, obviously. Austin Gale of Pro Football Focus. We've been on a, a nice run there. But specifically to Dane, he's dropped a couple of interesting bits. Uh, he is really open in terms of all the assets they have, uh, whether to just go with the picks that are available, get you a 4, 10, 35, 38. If you just pick players that are there, he feels very confident that the Jets can get really good players if they simply stay. He also says they should have the flexibility, and Joe Douglas has to have the phone on so they can move and groove around the board and be aggressive for guys that are high on their board. And uh, again, he's a big cave on Thibodeau guy, and for good reason. He thinks that uh, he would be a wonderful fit there. You mentioned the wide receivers, obviously, which would intrigue him greatly. He was a big um, uh, Tulsa guy uh, for Tyler Smith. Uh, He was a big guy there. But one really interesting nugget that stood out from his conversation was in his seven-round mock draft. He had Andrew Booth going to the Jets, the cornerback out of Clemson. He's had a lot of injury concerns recently, which could scare off a lot of Jets fans thinking D. Milner. But he just has elite traits, and he could be the corner that they've been searching for to pair with DJ Reed Jr. He, that's one of the big nuggets I took away from that conversation. But again, you can listen to the full thing on youtube.com slash boygreen25. Absolutely, Paul. Thanks all the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, man.